Hi, this is Maureen Metcalf, your host for Innovating Leadership, Co-Creating Our Future. I am really excited about this program, highlighting the accomplishments of three very successful women. So let's start with Amanda Ellis. Our second guest is Adil Anamtawi and Habiba Ali. Our guests want you to be inspired by the difference women leaders can make in the world. We are delighted to have all of you as our guests and our listeners. Thank you so much, Maureen. It's wonderful to be on the show with Hadil and Habiba, who are such outstanding women leaders in their own context. Thank you very much, Maureen, for having us. And we are really happy to be here. Where I come from, northern Nigeria, is actually a region that, um, you know, up till now we have women who live in Perda. Perda, if you don't know, is the religious practice of putting women in isolation, you know, away from um, other people's eyes, mainly supposed to be that they are protected by their husbands and all that. And this, from time, has actually made the woman's contribution in every aspect of development really minimal because for us in the north of Nigeria, a woman is more of a protected person and not to be seen or even heard as much. Growing up with a mother who was quite feisty and struggling and for this kind of region, it's really, really rare for you to find a woman who was that active. I learned to understand what the needs of the community were because my father luckily took us into a lot of rural areas and my mom used to have a roadside food restaurant. Growing up, I found out that most of the times that we were facing the open fire, cooking food to sell in that roadside restaurant by the kerosene lantern, we had some health effects on us. And this just made me keep thinking of the rural woman who this was her life. This is how she cooked day in, day out. And with the way the buildings were built with her, all the enclosures and everything, she suffered indoor air pollution so much and would actually be in the statistics of about 1.4 billion women who died out of indoor air pollution. And this made me decide that I had to do something about it. Looking at energy and finding solutions to energy problems in rural communities, which could be for electricity, for cooking or any other one. And this is what we really need in um, rural Nigeria, which is for cooking or for changing the lighting solutions from kerosene lanterns. One was already using energy to solve a multiple of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And this really is the reason why I'm supporting the SDGs. I didn't start out thinking I was going to support the SDGs. It just so happened that most of the sustainable development goal points are actually being sorted by my work, which is renewable energies. For example, it solves the problem of inequalities because we work with a network of women entrepreneurs in rural communities who resell our products. So it helps with the goal five of the SDGs. It also helps with inequalities. It sorts the problem of energy, of course, goal seven. It ensures um, better environments, fights climate change, and uh, improves human health as well. The work you're doing is absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Okay, and Hadil? Yeah, thank you for having us. My name is Hadil Anaptawi. I'm coming from Jordan in the Middle East. Just to give you an idea, Jordan is 10 million population, two of which are refugees, and our unemployment rate is 19%, and we are a young population where 35% of our people are younger than 15 years old. I come from a family where we are like four sisters with no brothers, and I was blessed to have good education. My parents, they are from Palestinian origin, where they left Palestine to get a better life, actually. And education was the focus and girls empowerment was the focus of my parents. This is the way for us to lead a successful future. So this is the base of my background. I personally believe that good education is not about memorizing facts. It's about training the mind to think. And basically, the problem that we tackle is the lack of creative and critical thinking activities to support the education of our children. We all know that the future needs more creative education and more creative problem solvers. Unfortunately, our educational system does not support these things. So we established the Alchemist Lab in 2012 through workshops and hands-on experiences with focus on STEM. Basically, our problem has another level that in Jordan, girls at the age of 15, they outscore boys in uh, STEM. However, their participation in STEM careers is less than 30 percent. So we launched in 2015 a program called Go Girls, where we train girls to ask questions, research data, identify problems, build a solution, test the solution. And not only this, we also highlight uh, different empowering career options for them. And we highlight different women in STEM role models for these girls. 
We've reached so far more than 35,000 children, boys and girls in Jordan, in the cities, in the villages, less fortunate areas, and also in refugee camps. And we do believe that we advance the UN SDGs of good education and gender equality through our programs because we do but good education will lead to advancing all other goals in the future, even beyond 230. And we hope that we uh, will empower more children in the Middle East in the future. It's amazing to hear the range of impacts you're making. So I wanted to see if one of you can talk about what challenges have you faced as a woman leader in your home environment? Maureen, I wanted to talk a little bit about New Zealand because it was the first country in the world where women won the right to vote in 1893. And yet, when I started work as a young diplomat in the foreign ministry in 1988, I was told I couldn't attend a meeting, which it was my job to take the minutes for, for Pacific Economic Cooperation given that the meeting was being held at an all-men's club called the Wellington Club. So I think the point to highlight from a gender perspective is that in no country in the world has gender equality yet been achieved, even in a country like mine where women had the right to vote so early. And in fact, only six countries actually have a level playing field in terms of legislation. And that's why for us the We Empower UN SDG Challenge is so important because women like Hadil and Habiba, who are really making a difference in their home community, where there are such big obstacles, incredible role models for others. So I just wanted to say that even in developed countries, there are still challenges for women. We want to talk about some of the challenges you are facing and how you overcome them. So let's start with Hadil and then we'll move to Habiba. Yeah, I'll give uh, some details about uh, Jordan and the Middle East. We're similar to what Habiba said at the beginning, that we're more in a culture where we raise that men, they are financial providers of the family. And I would say the main challenge for entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs in particular, is access to finance. I've started like more than 10 years ago in my entrepreneurship journey. I've established my first company and I witness actually uh, throughout the years more advances in Jordan concerning this because there are many like uh, accelerators and many organizations that are encouraging more women entrepreneurs to go into this field. Uh, however, when I say access to finances, I don't mean exactly laws in Jordan who give like uh, men uh, access to money more than women. However, I mean that it's a country dominated by men in a certain positions. So access to men through their networks to reach people who can finance their project is something of an advantage to them. And also access to network because not all women, as I said, uh, unemployment rate for women is really high. Uh, women usually, they don't have that network that can support them beginning an enterprise or an organization by supporting financing them. Personally, I overcome uh, uh, these challenges by going to my closer trusted circle of people who were trusted in my capabilities. So they invested in my company. And after that, I started to go to women entrepreneurs and working women in leadership positions in companies where I pitched my business and my story uh, so uh, to encourage them to uh, help invest in my programs. So basically, I would say access to finance is the main challenges and to network who can support my company. That was the main challenge. Thank you, Adil, and thank you, um, Maureen, again. There's a, you know, a variety of challenges that we face as entrepreneurs in Nigeria, and it also varies between industries. For me, I can see a lot, a lot of things that happen, but one common thing that goes across all industries will be the idea of taking women seriously. I basically had a fight almost today with some bankers at, at a program for women there's a new program the American embassy is doing called the Academy for Women Entrepreneurs. And the bankers came to speak and they are talking about giving women, you know, this very little amounts of money just to, you know, help them do their businesses. And one of the things I said, I was so angry because one of the statement he actually made was, well, how much money do you need as a woman? I mean, it's not going to be more than a millionaire, which is about maybe $3,000 or something. And I'm like, look, we are beyond needing a million dollars to run a business that actually needs a lot more than that. It's time you start taking those women seriously and realizing yeah. that it's not just about that woman thing. It's not something to just do on the side so your wife is kept busy. It's not something your daughter has disturbed you or she wants to do. It's high time you realize that women want to also run successful big businesses. I mean, what stops you from giving a woman the same 150 million you want to give a man? 
this for me is one of the problems that I think cuts across all of the sectors. But specifically for me in the renewable energy sector, being a male dominated field, it's always a hassle to make myself heard. It's always a high hassle for me. I always, I use this denotation saying it's like, you know, you're sinking in the sea and you're trying, finally trying to break ground and, you know, all the men just come down and push you back in. So you find you're constantly struggling to stand out, to make your voice heard. And then there are other, of course, structural um, and political policy wise challenges, like how we have for my product. I mean, almost half of it has to come from overseas and I have to come through customs clearing issues and you know, so many issues. And then it's about getting access to finance, of course, is one thing that everybody faces, whether it's in Nigeria or in Jordan. So these are the kind of things we face as business owners in, um, I mean, the world over. But for specifically for me in Nigeria, this is one thing that I see. Go ahead, Amanda. Those challenges, absolutely the kinds of things that we realized working at the World Bank. As an economist who also worked in finance for a while in Australia, we started a whole program around women's markets because there were the same kinds of barriers to women in developed countries too, but they didn't go into the legal realm. And so when I was working at the World Bank, we started a new program called GEM, Gender Entrepreneurship Markets. And those were the first lines of credit dedicated to women in Africa because in many countries women don't own land and that is often a custom law impediment which means it's very difficult to get collateral for a business loan and so what's been interesting is it was a real battle to even get 15 million dollars for the first bank we did which was Access Bank in Nigeria but now it's fascinating to see that this problem has really been recognized globally the International Finance Corporation, the private sector arm of the World Bank, now has a billion dollar fund. I was very proud in 2000 to be a founding member of the Global Banking Alliance for Women, which now has over 60 member banks who are aware of the problems that Hadil and Habiba raised concerning access to finance for women and are really trying to rectify those. That said, something like only 2% of venture capital goes to women's businesses. And that's why we felt it was so important to start the UN SDG Challenge to highlight the wonderful work that women like Hadil and Habiba are doing in their countries despite the obstacles. Hadil and Habiba, can you yeah. talk a little bit about the lessons that you have for other women who are committed to supporting the UN Sustainable Development Goals, especially SDG 5 to promote gender equality and empower women and girls, specifically because you have come so far in, in your journeys and are now the role models? I'll start first, uh, Habiba, if you allow me. Uh, basically, I'm a strong advocate for girls' empowerment. And I always say, if all women around the world, entrepreneurs, working women, women in leadership positions, if they like uh, stop a bit and think what they learned throughout these years of experience and start to give these lessons to young girls at early age, this would be very empowering for uh, girls. I'm an advocate for, girl, for girls' empowerment. I'm an advocate for early intervention for women empowerment. I always say that if we want to have more women empowered, the least agony for women themselves, especially in less fortunate areas, we start early enough at school through the educational system to empower these girls with the skills they need. Creative and critical thinking, entrepreneurship skills, and also financial literacy, because this is not part of the way we raise our girls in our region. Uh, so what I learned uh, to start to every woman entrepreneur to start to uh, lead initiatives in her areas where she can empower other women and other young girls to start their journey and to pass the skills that we learned, to pass the challenges that we had. We had uh, to pass the lessons that we learned to overcome uh, these challenges. And this is exactly what, uh, what we need to do everywhere in order to build successful enterprises and also to build a sustainable movement towards girls empowerment. So, uh, both boys and girls, my dream is in the future that more boys will really be advocates for gender equality and uh, for girls and women empowerment. So the educational system have to be changed a bit. I think it's yeah. a critical point that the impact of the education system on both boys and girls, because as we separate and young men don't understand their role as advocates, we all lose. Yeah. yeah. 
one video that went viral uh, like a couple of months ago it was like a test at school they talked to boys and girls they given them the opportunity both to work this to, to do the same work and then they've given different pays for them and kids were surprised why should they uh, have different pays so at school uh, kids they feel that they are equal boys and girls and start with the cultural pressure on them they start to like think differently and think no woman should be like this uh, men should be like this and i think education would help a lot solve this issue i will add that one of the lessons that i've learned is to always own my success and this has been made loud and clear for me especially with my involvement with vital voices group which through it we also is one of the partners in the un sdg un we empower challenge so many times women as women we we do a lot of good things and we just want to keep quiet about it we want to be humble about it we just don't want to be out there saying this is what we do and this is how we're doing it meanwhile we're doing a lot of amazing things so i want to encourage us women that as a leader the best way you can help the other woman to become who she should be is by actually owning your success and letting it out there owning the fact that we as women are the mothers and the nurturers of all the leaders out there be it a man or a woman so own your success and let it out there empowering other women and creating men as advocates is a real responsibility when i was ambassador to the united nations in geneva we actually had a group of women ambassadors who would come together and every time there was a review of country legislation we would all ask questions relating to gender equality and women's empowerment and i think that power of coalition for change and helping to educate men to become advocates as well can really make a difference in moving the dial on un sdg 5 and we have a coalition at the moment which is very much an SDG 17 which means a multi stakeholder partnership among UN women the interparliamentary union the council of women world leaders the women political leaders forum the world bank private sector companies and civil society to really take this to the next level so it's i think another important thing for women to remember that we do need to support and promote each other's work so that we can help make the world a better place and co-create the future we want. Thank you, Amanda. So as a partner to the We Empower UN Sustainable Development Goal Challenge, the International Leadership Association provided one-on-one mentoring and We Empower provided a virtual peer network, Habiba. For me the mentoring I've had so many I mean I've had the opportunity to be mentored a lot of times and it's all been wonderful experiences but I must say that this time it was a different kind of mentorship for me because it was geared towards my leadership my role as a leader one of the things I was very lucky and I keep telling a lot of people who care to listen that I was very lucky to have been paired with a wonderful mentor um Stella Anko Professor Stella Anko Moshi is out of Pretoria she's working with the University of Pretoria one of the first things she had me do was to tell a future story writing a story in the future of what i would want to see it's like a vision story what do i want people to say like it could be in the newspaper in 5 years time about me what it did to me was this was at a very difficult moment for me in my business life and you know owning my leadership period because we had a lot of challenges we were going through professionally and then i also had personal challenges i was going through working with stella really helped me to clarity about the whole thing she we were supposed to have a monthly um, meeting but she, because i had that those issues at that time she took her time and said you know what i will check up on you every week just to be sure things are going to the way we want She made me see things in a clearer vision and she was ensuring she was following me up to achieve the things that I needed to achieve and professionally and even personally because she was very clear that until you have a, a settled personal life professionally you were still going to struggle and this experience for me has been the best of my mentorship experiences most times it's always been work 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 
I mean, it's always either one aspect of my business is marketing, no, it is the other one is um, customer relations. But this was like an all rounder trying to say, no, you had this organization. This is where you want the organization to be in in this time. And this is what you need to be as a leader to drive it there. And it helped me to step back and understand that once in a while, I need to sit on the balcony sort of and watch the dance floor of my business and try to streamline what needs to be done strategically. That's take myself out of the tactical activities, strategically plan. And this for me has actually given me like a breather because it's made me realize that I could actually breathe and just let other people do the work. While breathing, it helps me to be able to make strategies and plans that were going to grow the business in a better direction. So it's been a very, very wonderful experience. We often hear the polished version of how we get here. And so I really appreciate the very personal story. Hadil. Entrepreneurs, usually, they always seek mentors indirectly in certain fields that will grow their businesses, thinking that, okay, a finance mentor or a marketing mentor or a strategy mentor, uh, this is what's needed. And uh, women entrepreneurs in particular, they forget that they need some sort of coaches to help them throughout the daily challenges, the struggles that they face that sometimes lower the confidence. So we never think that if we grow our capabilities as leaders and grow our capacity to be more confident, to run our businesses, this is really essential for the growth of our uh, companies. And for the first time, I was given the chance to talk to a mentor with something outside the Excel sheets and outside business plans and these things. And uh, we started to talk about things that I think that is worrying for uh, for me, that uh, are scaring uh, me, that are like maybe obstacles for my personal growth as a leader. That was really a great experience. It was a perfect match, actually. Not myself, Habiba uh, mentioned this and all other awardees that they were like impressed with how the match was done, where we get matched with the, the right mentors. My mentor was always there for me through different channels, actually. Aside from the calls and the mentoring calls that we used to, to take, she was like online through LinkedIn and through other channels. Uh, just encouraging me uh, whenever I do something that we agreed that I should do in order to help uh, my leadership journey. She would like send comments that, oh, this is good. Do this and do this. So so it was like a, a very good experience. And I highly encourage other entrepreneurs to have mentors and personal mentors, leadership mentors, aside from other mentors that are technical that will add uh, really growth to the company. So it was a great opportunity. We thank ILA and we empower Award for this, actually. Amanda, how can mentoring, peer networks, and other leadership tools help promote more women into leadership roles and more senior roles with global impact? Hadil and Habiba have done an extraordinary job of conveying just how important it is to have a mentor, somebody that you can work with and trust to have your best interests at heart. I would also add within big organizations, it can be very useful to have a sponsor. And the differentiation between the two terms is important. While a mentor is a trusted advisor, a sponsor is someone who will actually advocate on your behalf. And often for women, that's a very important role in big organizations where, as Habiba said earlier, often women are not good at blowing our own horns and letting people know about achievements. So having somebody who is, slightly more senior in the organization and can help do that for you and sponsor you is really critical. And finally, too, there was an opportunity for the We Empower winners to participate in a virtual peer network. And I think it can be very helpful to not only have one-on-one -on -one support relationships, but also to have a group of your peers who are able to act as sounding boards and trusted advisors. And just to sign off, I wanted to say as co-chair of the We Empower UNSDT Challenge, how thankful we are to the International Leadership Association and particularly President Cynthia Cherry for all of the support and resources that you have contributed to the success of the program. Thank you so much. In the last conversation, Habiba, you talked about the future and what future you imagined for yourself. Can you give us a summary of what that looks like? For us, uh, one of the things I saw when I was doing the vision and exercise was 
community because what we do is community wide. We try to bring energy solutions to communities. We're not saying this is the right solution or this is not the right solution. We're looking inwards and finding what the problems really are and finding tailor made solutions for communities. And we've got over 70% of our population living in rural communities. So one of the things I would love to see in future, and I always see this, is communities that are being lit up because so say touched their life. So say is the name of the company. And for every time I imagine myself flying over a region and just seeing these flags of so say lighting up, you know, communities. So I imagine one on my visioning exercise, one of the things I said was a period where it is said. 15,000 communities in rural northern Nigeria have been powered through the efforts of SUSE. That's amazing. That vision is phenomenal. How long will it take you to get there? It will take a long time, but I'm looking at at most 10 years to get there. And just thinking of the number of lives impacted. The the children impacted, the knowledge centers where we have computers for children to play with. We have um, hospitals being lit up by solar energy we have solar dryers. So it's it's a whole lot of things that you can actually achieve just by using renewable energies. And so um, we're looking at it and saying there's so much that can be done and why not do it now? And it could be through mini grids. It could be through solar home systems. It could be through any of the productive use technologies as well. As we are wrapping up, there are women leaders making a difference by promoting positive change in their local communities, which can have a global impact. And it was, Habiba, you just did a beautiful example of talking about that. As we're coming to a close, I wanted to ask each of you to share contact information. Mine, uh, anaptawi underscore hadil at yahoo.com. And you can find us online, the alchemistlabkids.com. Perfect. Thank you. And Habiba? I am Habiba, H-A-B-I-B-A, at S-O-S-A-I-R-E-N dot org. S-O-S-A-I-R-E-N dot org is also the website. Thank you so much, everyone, for giving us such an inspirational conversation. This is Innovating Leadership, Co-Creating Our Future. I'm Maureen Metcalf, and I would love to hear your comments and input, and we look forward to you joining us again soon.